is, uh, this is uh, uh, the panel is uh, also getting formed along the way because Daniel Gross is arriving uh, by train. Hopefully, he will arrive in time before the panel is over. <laughs> uh, so, let me say a few words uh, about uh, the motivation for this panel and what is the what is or what are the, the key uh, issues here? Well, the theme of this session, in a way, uh, is uh, pretty fundamental to macroprudential policy because it, it is about how you should set macropru in an expansion, and more specifically, in uh, at a time when monetary policy is lax, but. Uh, is expected to um, tighten uh, sometime in the future. Uh, in a way, this question is fundamental because it brings us back to the very, uh, very, very birth, uh, uh, the foundation of uh, 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 macroprudential policy. Because if you remember, economists started uh, arguing for the need of macroprudential policy tools precisely uh, at the time, uh, uh, you know, after the the, the subprime crisis, uh, at a time when uh, monetary policy had been lax for a long time. Uh, had uh, accompanied a very long expansion of the economy and uh, uh, had been accompanied by excessive credit creation and uh, bubble-like uh, episodes, uh, which then were uh, followed by uh, the crash. Uh, and uh, the crash was, to a certain extent, also linked to a tightening of monetary policy. So. Uh, at that time, uh, people started arguing for the need of uh, alternative uh, policy tools, macroprudential policy tools, direct, directed specifically at addressing excessive credit creation. Uh, since it was realized that monetary policy had not been able to moderate uh, the pre-crisis excessive credit creation, had actually potentially contributed to that, and uh, had uh, also, uh, if anything, potentially uh, contributed also uh, to precipitating the crisis once interest rates were raised. So somehow uh, we all realized that uh, something was missing in the policy, in the policy uh, toolkit. Uh, so the key question for this panel, as I see it, is whether and to what extent uh, now we are in a situation anywhere close to that of, say, 2005, 2006, and therefore we should start thinking about activating a restricting uh, macro proof stance, uh, and if so, how fast and uh, how much. So these are questions that, for instance, yesterday, uh, Governor Lane was addressing his uh, speech. What are the ingredients that we find again that we found at that time? Well, as I said, the long lasting, uh, very expansionary monetary policy and the expectation that it would. Um, uh, it, it is about to end. Bubble-like symptoms in some uh, uh, asset markets, especially some real estate markets in Northern Europe uh, and in the no stock market, potentially, especially in the US. Search for yield by banks and non-banks, and also to some extent by households. So we do have some uh, of the ingredients uh, that we had at that time. It is uh, not clear, however, if we have excessive private credit creation. And you know, for instance, this morning, uh, Jeffrey Franks from the IMF said, no, we don't have generalized excessive credit creation. Maybe we have some pockets of uh, excessive credit creation, but not uh, generalized. And others have different opinions on, on, on that. Uh, in addition, I would like to remind uh, the panel and all of you that we do have uh, two all European ingredients of the financial crisis still with us. These are typical uh, of Europe, especially of the uh, euro area uh, debt crisis, major faults that uh, European regulators unfortunately have not uh, addressed uh, uh, after the crisis. One is uh, large sovereign exposures of banks uh, versus uh, domestic governments, especially in fiscal, fiscally vulnerable countries such as Italy. Uh, so the, so the sovereign bank nexus uh, is uh, still alive and well uh, and could start operating any time. And uh, uh, in fact, it's probably already operating. And second, uh, uh, structural overcapacity of the banking sector uh, leading to uh, low profitability uh, or weakness uh, of, of banks. In some countries aggravated by the legacy of uh, large uh, stocks of non-performing loans. And finally, uh, to top uh, the list, uh, there is no shortage of possible detonators. Uh, say, trade war leading to a, a, a substantial slowdown or even a crisis in China, 
Italian populist. We saw this morning the announcement of the new budget uh, in Italy with a 2.4% per, uh, projected deficit uh, GDP ratio. So potential resumption of euro area sovereign crisis. Brexit, you have it. So there is a, 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 a considerable list of possible, uh, you know, uh, uh, fuses that could uh, actually uh, blow up. So uh, then without any further ado, I give the word uh, uh, to the panel on essentially these issues, uh, whether macroprudential policy should actually uh, be set differently in uh, uh, relative to the recent past uh, in view of all these elements. So Esther, uh, Faya will start uh, the uh, panel. Esther is a uh, full professor at Frankfurt Goethe University <coughs> and she will give us uh, uh, um, insights uh, from her um, uh, evidence uh, on uh, the relationship between monetary policy and uh, um, uh, macro uh, prudential risk, uh, stability uh, risk uh, at the macroeconomic level. Then uh, uh, Peter Pryde will talk about uh, 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 the relationship between monetary policy and macro prudential policy, but also other policies such as regulatory policy and how uh, uh, macro pro tools should actually be used, if I understood Look correctly. Interesting, yes. And uh, Per Kallesen will, uh, from the Danish Central Bank, uh, will uh, uh, give uh -huh. us uh, a practitioner's viewpoint from uh, from the viewpoint of uh, a small uh, uh, country, uh, Nordic country, and uh, and then uh, hopefully Daniel Gross uh, will. Uh, 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 will uh, also come in in time and uh, also talk about the relationship between uh, macro policy and uh, monetary policy. And uh, Pierre Richard Agenor that will be connected uh, with us uh, from from uh, from the University of Manchester. Will be connected um, uh, with us uh, um, telematically. He will uh, actually uh, uh, give us uh, a kind of more international perspective. Uh, on, uh, on macroprudential policy will tell us how in uh, uh, emerging markets uh, macroprudential policy could be set uh, so as to potentially control for the effects of normalization of monetary policy in uh, advanced economies. So that, that's kind of like the menu, the, the floor to uh, Esther. Is there a pointer for to, uh, uh, to pointer. change slides? Okay. I think Perfect. pointer is okay, here. Okay, then, then, then I will speak from there. Um, I think it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so, um, thanks a lot for inviting me in these interesting panels and to Marco for organizing it so beautifully. Um, so, I, I, I think given uh, that I'm the first, I mean, I, I kind of, um, you know, introduced the question or the motivation for what is, what should be the role of monetary policy or possibly the role of or the coordination, the possible coordination of monetary policy and macroprudential policy for the future. So we're coming out from a number of years of uh, quantitative easing and, um, you know, of course, the setup of, of the banking union. Um, so what, what I'm going to ask basically is, uh, is, is what will be the role of, uh, what would be the role of uh, monetary policy for risk? There is one thing that we have already known from all of those years, which is the fact that um, expansionary policy produces some risk bank risk-taking channel. Um, most of the evidence and most of the theoretical works that was done so far, there I mention only a few that I know more closely or other papers that have been uh, widely discussed, is that uh, expansionary monetary policy could, uh, of course, induce banks to various forms of risk-taking, like search for yields or excessive uh, risk-taking. But most of the measures on the empirical sides were on bank-level data, which is like credit registry data, survey data, uh, other type of uh, risk indicators from uh, internal models. But I mean, one reason for which this you know, risk taking channel might ever be relevant for monetary policy, or at least what the policy maker would tell you, is that is this, you know, risk taking relevant if it is only at the level of one bank, well, we may contain it, even with microprudential policy, we don't even have to go to macroprudential policy. So the question becomes relevant for the policy maker in terms of exiting from the quantitative easing or maybe asking for more coordination with macroprudential policy only to the extent that, uh, you know, expansionary policy or other forms of policies that may trigger moral hazard do have 
aggregate effects, um, so effects on the real economy, and if they trigger increases in systemic risk. So whether this becomes really relevant um, at the more systemic level. So because this question, I mean, this, this question, which is actually very, very simple, was missing from the literature. Um, I did some work with uh, Zorin Kara, who is a junior um, person in my chair, and you know, using uh, somehow very standard techniques, uh, but an extensive set of data, uh, what we did was to ask what is the impact of monetary policy on measures of systemic risk. So is it true that expansionary policy is increasing systemic risk or not? Because if it increases the risk of one bank, we tackle that and we don't worry anymore. And you know, we keep uh, doing it just based on, 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 on what GDP growth is. Um, so, I mean, there are a number, I mean, to, to, to make sure that our results are robust, we do a number of, uh, of, uh, of checks. So first of all, we construct different measures of systemic risk, the most famous one ranging from uh, uh, COVA, uh, so, so conditional value at risk based on equities and CDS, long run marginal shortfall of various forms. And then we look at evidence across different countries, also focus on the US, um, and we also, um, try to look at the causes of this, whether this is triggered by a classical leverage channel as Ray and Miranda Grippino or Bruno and Shin are, uh, are proposing. And we also look at different, for, I mean, a different type of policies. So we compare conventional versus unconventional using shadow rates, using um, the, uh, the balance sheet of banks. Um, we identify monetary policy shocks. I mean, this is techniques where known in central bank. You can just look at the uh, regular policy rate or you can identify policy shocks at high frequency with the narrative approach. So we try a number of things. We, I will show you four or five graphs. We have actually several in the paper, but the response is invariably consistent. Uh, so an increase of interest rate reduces risk, any measure of systemic risk, and the decrease of interest rate increases any measure of systemic risk. And what we find is that one of the main channels is leverage, so it's more of a risk taking on the liability side than on the asset side. And, um, you know, Ray and Agrippino actually say, you know, this is due to expansionary policy from the US. So the European monetary policy doesn't affect that much. We find that there is equal responsibility, shared responsibility of both policies. So, I mean, just four figures, but again, you know, one, if you're curious about all the type of robustness checks, I mean, we have also had referees going in through those things. Um, so here, I mean, here is the basic figure. So we have a panel VAR across a number of countries, which I mentioned down there, so Germany, France, Spain, Netherlands, and Italy. Um, we, I'm showing just the response to the shadow rate, which is one of the measures that is used for unconventional monetary policy, but we have the equivalent for conventional monetary policy and for high frequency data. And as you can see, an increase in the shadow rate reduces risk. In some cases, like measures of realized volatility of delta cova, the decreases on jump. On other cases where the prices takes longer to price, for instance, for equities as opposed to CDS, where the market say, take longer to price, the uh, decrease in risk occurs more at medium. Uh, you, you see it in the last uh, three panels here, of course, at later uh, dates. Um, this one is uh, um, uh, so. Um, this one is basically goes to zoom even more into the uh, real quantitative easing because we have a response. So the third uh, column of panels is basically an increase in balance sheet of central banks, um, and as you can see, an increase in balance sheet of central banks, which is an expansionary policy, increases any of the measures of systemic risk we consider. So long run marginal force shortfall, which is the uh, more persistent and, you know, on impact, realized volatility response by more, but also Delta Covar. Um, okay, here we do, I mean, the same exercise for the US. So we say it's just a European thing or is the, the US. Oh, by the way, we also check pre-crisis period, post-crisis period. Even in the pre-crisis period, it was there. Um, so here we do, for the US, we have a huge amount of uh, information from other variables. So we use this, um, you you know, FAVAR, which is basically a VR, where you, you throw a number of controls so that you make sure that the responses of financial markets are not, um, you know, are not capturing other facts. Um, and so here again, what you can see, I mean, there is an increase in the interest rate, which is the left 
panel, the left uh, second panel, and uh, an increase in interest rate again decreases all the top panels, which are all the systemic risk measures. In this case, our identification of the monetary policy shock is through this um, narrative approach by Guga Yanak and uh, et al. Um, okay, next, uh, I mean, I, so <coughs> this, um, um, this is again, I mean, j just to zoom on, on, on the causes of this, on the channels. So the question is, okay, but, you know, if we have to use macroprudential policy or if we have to coordinate monetary policy, shall we try to zoom a little bit into this? And so here what we do, I mean, it's very difficult to get this bank leverage data. Um, but in the end, we managed, and we managed even to compute them at market values, which is actually uh, quite, uh, requires a quite complex procedures. But here, what we show you in the third column is the leverage response to, um, to an increase in, uh, in the interest rate, and in the last column, again, uh, the systemic risk measures. And what you see is that significantly, the, I mean, in most cases, um, although, I mean, this not always full significance, but the leverage uh, goes down when there is an increase in, uh, in monetary policy together with risk. So there seems to be some synchronization about the, the, the risk on the liability side and the systemic risk. And then the last thing I want to tell you is, Again, so this, this uh, idea uh, proposed by Sheen, uh, but Eleni as well, with, um, yeah, well, as well with, of, the global, uh, of the global leverage cycle. So, you know, this is this pensionary monetary policy in the US has an exorbitant privilege. They are extracting a lot of benefits out of this, but they are basically exporting risk to other countries. So the question is, and, and, and the, do, this might be, I mean, the impact of US monetary policy might be bigger, more important than the other one. So I know this difficult. This graph is difficult to read. Uh, maybe you can read it later when you have the slides there. But the blue line is the U.S. monetary policy, and uh, the black line uh, sh dashed uh, is the is the is, is the response only to the ECB uh, monetary policy. We actually. Uh, show, I mean, there are also, of course, the error bands. But uh, if you look, if you zoom into the panels, what you see is that um, given, a, 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 given an increase in, inter in both interest rates, again, risk goes down. The responsibility is equally shared. So the impact of US monetary policy and uh, European monetary policy is, 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 is basically more or less the same. So there are no um, bigger spillovers, at least from what we can see here, from, uh, 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 you know, from, from across the ocean. To conclude, I mean, this is only opening up the question you know, of what is the impact if, if, there is any, if there is any unintended consequence, and then of course this should be tamed with macroprudential policy, this doesn't tell you anything, by the way, on the welfare consequences of risk. It might be that we are all happy that there is a lot of risk. That's, um, you know, this is in the United States, they always say, you know, risk is, is, is a triggering innovation. So that might all be good. This thing just limits itself to say, you know, we knew that there was a risk-taking channel on the individual bank side. We didn't know whether this had contagious effects or macroprudential or macro externalities such that it would turn into a systemic risk-taking channel. And I think this evidence points very strongly into that direction. Okay, thank you very much, Esther. So the floor then to Peter Pratt from the ECB. I think it's uh, the uh, fifth time I will address the topic about monetary policy and financial stability in one week. So I wonder, <laughs> no, but I wonder why, actually. So, uh, and I think the timing is, uh, the, it's not a coincidence. I think it's, uh, it means something. So that's my first point. Well, so what is the narrative? Um, the narrative is the following. First point. Economic conditions uh, in Europe uh, have improved uh, very much over the past three years, very simple, uh, and expected to, be, to remain favorable in spite, Marco, of, of all the headwinds that you mentioned, hopefully, are not materialized. But economic conditions have improved. At the same time, at the same time, this is important, at the same time, this is conditional on the persistence of a high degree of monetary accommodation, high degree of monetary stimulus. So that's a combination. Of course, the normalization process thus is expected to be long, 
And uh, the story, of course, is low rate for long times and what are the implications for financial stability. Uh, we say this normalization process, which is long, is necessary to bring back inflation to our aim. So that's my, my first point. The second point, of course, and we are well aware of that, and that comes from history, is that it's in good times that financial excesses are being built up in good times. So are we in good times or not in good times? We're in this transition that you mentioned before. And that's why, you know, we are so <laughs> attentive to that. So on one hand, hi, Daniel, just I pause a second so you can listen to what I say. C'est une entrée réussie, Daniel. <laughs> Come over. So on one hand, on one hand, you have this uh, policy of low rate for long times. On the other hand, of course, it's in good time that there is kind of build, being built up. So that's the second point I, uh, I was making. So there is at this juncture a tension, of course, between you know this monetary policy, which is necessary to bring back inflation to the aim and the build-up of risk you know, in good times, which we have to assess. So that's my, my second point. The third point, of course, and that's, I think, what we have been doing here, is what is our assessment then? Because we're in this transition uh, period. Well, there are two parts in the assessment. Well, you look at uh, financial stability reviews. I looked before coming in again. I, uh, because I deal with monetary policy now, so I don't see, uh, and you mentioned that, Marco, too, no generalized uh, financial excesses in Europe. There are pockets of excesses, uh, but uh, we don't see. How do we know? Because I'll go a little bit to what Esther was saying. And that's uh, for the discussion, I'm, because I'm not <laughs> making a speech here. It's just introduce, kick off a discussion. Well, we look at leverage, of course. We look at maturity transformation. We look about uh, funding, fragilities, and all that, complexity. And then I, I, I'm a bit puzzled. I'm not so sure I, I know. You had, uh, uh, I was unfortunately not here, we come from London, but you had this, you know, what is leverage today? How do you measure? You say it's difficult to find, but you, you find easy measures of leverage. I don't know how you, you measure leverage. It's not easy. But <laughs> no, it's, it, it's difficult to find, but it's difficult to measure. Uh, even if you can find it, it's difficult to grasp. And, uh, and uh, the interaction between leverage and liquidity is, of course, the tricky thing, of course, because you have to combine the two. And uh, of course, we have the shadow banking system. And then I started to prepare this meeting to look a little bit about the public documentations, because I'm not a member of the SRB. But I look at what is public. And the more I read, of course, the more I'm puzzled about this. I don't know the size of the problem, of course. But I know from, from what I read that I'm not reassured as a sort of citizen, you know, uh, looking about what is being done in financial stability. It may be that the size of a problem, you know, the, the fact that we don't understand leverage very much in the shadow banking system, I mean leverage and liquidity uh, issues together. Uh, the, the, we don't grasp this, and I see, you know, the, the, the attempts of the FSB, uh, with EOSCO, of course, to, to try to measure and benchmark, you know, uh, things which are very difficult to do anyway. So, so that's, uh, I say, well, I got to my, my question, what is our assessment? First assessment, prima facie, I say no general financial excesses, there are pockets, and then you have something behind you don't understand very well. And you say, well, if there is a shock at some point, how is it going to to pass through in, in the system. So that, that I, I have some reservation there. The second issue, of course, is from the monetary policy side, and I think, Daniel, you will address the other thing, is that we cannot exclude also, in the description I made before, miscalibration of monetary policy. You could, because I say, and that's the policy and the assessment of the governing council, I think it's very well founded, but we have to be modest. So you cannot exclude that this policy of long, low rate for long time is a little bit for too long time. I know that many people will argue that. I will argue the opposite, but I say we also have to envisage that sort of possibility. So then when, when you say, aha, if you get it wrong, what, what are the consequences of being wrong, of course? And then, the, yeah, I see the screen, yes. Okay. okay. The consequences of being wrong, of course, depend of the trust you have in the macroprudential framework, of course. Because what you said, Mar Marco, before, in the boom time, because in the, in the great moderation time, of course, the regulatory framework was, I hope, very different from what it is today. Okay. And then you have to make this assessment, if I get it wrong, in the policy, which we think collectively in the governing council that it's the right policy. But they say, who knows? And then you, you have to look at the uh, macro prudential framework it is. 
And I talk about regulation here, not only about the, the sort of uh, counter-cyclical policies that you may need to, to put in place. And then, of course, the other point about the robustness of the macroprudential framework is, of course, the, that we are in a transition phase. I'm not talking about the shadow banking here, but I talk about the fact that there's still a lot of legacies uh, from the, the past crisis, of course, in the banking system, that I don't know how the BRD would function in practice. I have no idea if a systemic institution would be hit by a shock, how it worked. I, I mentioned en passant, maybe for the discussion, uh, I look with great interest always the stress test that you are being doing, and I, I think always, I wouldn't say funny because it's not funny, but interesting, uh, when I see that you, you stimulate very big recessions, two recessions in a row, and uh, the banks are very resilient uh, to two recessions in a row in general. I mean, they're very resilient. They, they lose three, four, five percentage points of capital indeed. But who, who would believe here that our economies or political systems would be stable if you have two recessions in a row, uh, given, of course, the fragilities we have already now? I'm talking here coming out of 10 years of you know, not so good economic conditions and testing two, uh, two recessions that would hit us uh, next year and the year after. So, uh, of course, I think it's right to do the way we do. It's not a criticism for that. But, of course, as I say, how resilient the system is, I think immediately about the political resilience and social resiliency of our systems, of course. And there we say that's a major risk that we have in our societies and in, in, in financial stability in general. I think that's not uh, original to say that. The last point uh, is uh, looking forward. And look, looking forward, of course, is uh, what you mentioned here in what we should, should uh, work on, is what about the macro uh, prudential instruments? And uh, here I, I want to convey maybe a personal impression that the macroprudential instruments in the hands of central banks, national central banks, with the top up by the ECB, uh, are, if I understand, framed, <laughs> limit, are things which are not in the responsibility of the central banks. There are some which are and some which are not. And which are not. Uh, there are a number of things you discussed here. You go through a political process. So the risk you have when you go into macroprudential uh, instruments is to say that politicians do not like some of the measures because they are very much exposed, and then that you are use the others, which are in the CRD, basically, the top-up you know, of the uh, counter-cyclical buffers and things like that, which are not necessarily optimum instruments that you have. En passant, also, I think it's in interesting, the debate in the US as I read it, between the stress test and the counter-cyclical buffers. Because if you say my stress tests are extremely strong, why do I need these macroprudential instruments? But that's in the same environment where the responsibility of supervisor central bankers is there. But there's another debate about the responsibilities of the other authorities. And I say, me as a central banker, usually, we have to be very careful because we already have appeared after the crisis as you know, the only game in town. And then you get additional responsibilities, I mean, as perceived by the public, that you have in hand the tools you know, to manage financial stability. And that, I think, is something we have to be very uh, careful about not taking all that responsibility where the authorities would prefer to be passive. Think about you know, what happens in mortgages, so difficult. Maybe, Per, you are going to talk the difficulties when you want to come with, with some instruments, macroprudential, in, in the real estate. But I'm mentioning, I mentioned solvency, uh, insolvency, solvency laws, and things like this. And the, the last one, but that's, uh, that's uh, in uh, five seconds, because we will discuss that later, is the international context and the spillovers, of course. Uh, because uh, while we have an assessment which is I think right, I think the assessment that we have here, and we do our best uh, in the stress test, you know, in the pockets, trying to address the pockets of exuberance. But it's clear also that the shock may come from other places where there is indeed uh, financial instability issues. And, uh, and that we have to, to think a little bit how would the spillover and what would be the reaction to these sorts of shocks. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good timing. Well, maybe Per, you go first. Sure. Um, what is this noise here? It's a microphone, Jean-Pierre. Ah, you can use, it. use this. Yeah, th thanks a lot for, for the invitation. Um, what I will do is to speak on recent developments in the macroprudential field in my own country, small uh, northern country. Uh, so it requires a few words on where we are in terms of the economic development, which fits 
pretty well into uh, the title of, of, of this session, affected by a macroeconomic boost, um, um, but uh, also with domestic considerations. Now, uh, the, 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 the strange thing, um, I have really not experienced that as my close to 40 years in this economic field is a is a, an expansion which is still healthy after some six, seven years. That's, that's very unusual. Uh, strong employment growth continues to surprise on the upside. Low, moderate GDP growth continuously surprising to the downside. Um, that implies low productivity growth. Public, private financial balances are, are fine. Uh, waste developments, inflation are, are moderate as they are everywhere. We do believe that we have, have supported this uh, moderation by some macroprudential uh, measures. I'll come back to that. But it's all in the context of very low uh, aggregate uh, credit growth, as, as you can imagine, that uh, inspires some pushback from the financial sector on sort of any kind of macroprudential measures you may come up with. Basically, I think there are two things we can do, potentially with macroeconomic policies, which you should worry about. The one is containing excesses, and the second one is preparing for the downturn. I'll deal with uh, both uh, issues here. Now, um, this is the house price uh, environment, uh, where you would uh, notice two things. The first is that the development we have had since the financial crisis for the country as large, single family houses, is much more moderate than what happened ahead of the financial crisis. And in that sense, it is a success of moderate recovery. The second thing is that owner occupied flats are continuously going, if not through the roof, but approaching the roof. This is a phenomenon contained to Copenhagen and other larger cities, but is obviously a clear observation point. This is uh, the numbers on credit growth. And if you uh, do what people normally do and what was recommended before we installed all this counter-cyclical buffer stuff, that is uh, calculate a trend and do the credit to GDP gap. As you can imagine, uh, current G uh, credit to GDP ratio is far below the trend. Why? Because the trend was pushed up so much ahead of the crisis that you should be very careful to rely on, on such an indicator. Um, so we try not to rely too much on it, but it um, generates this uh, explanatory problem. Now, one thing has been different this time, and that is despite uh, a, a significant pick up in the wealth to disposable income ratio, we are continuously seeing sort of an increase in the savings ratio here measured by the consumption ratio, consumption divided by disposable income. That has come down uh, very sharply since, uh, the, uh, since the, uh, the years of overheating, and it's still not going up. Why? Is it because people have been affected by a kind of mental shock, a kind of risk aversion we haven't seen before? Uh, is it because they have made so much savings out of lower interest payments because interest rates have become so low, given the very high level of household debt we have. They have saved a lot of money, but maybe they consider this to be transitory, and if that's the case, they may hold back their uh, consumption. Uh, by and large, this is a very welcome phenomenon, because if we, on top of what we otherwise have seen in the country, would have a, a tremendous boost in private consumption, that would uh, no doubt have led to overheating. But that's, that's part of the reason why credit growth is so uh, contained. Now, in terms of macroprudential initiatives, they are sort of divided by two. One we could call it change in framework conditions, um, and the other one I'll call nudging in the sense that they are more targeted measures and we may reverse them in the future. But um, we have done at least four measures. There are others, but uh, four small measures, all four measures. 2013, uh, an interest rate stress test measure on household repayment capacity. The idea is that um, they should uh, be able to, uh, uh, to uh, regardless of which kind of financing they do, they should be able to pay amortization and a fixed term interest rate even if they have a much cheaper loan. Then we have introduced uh, some limits to how much uh, expansion you can have uh, institution in the credit institutions of uh, deferred amortization and variable rate lending um, for, um, for, uh, for households. On the nudging issues, what we did was to uh, conduct some kind of 
stress test element of households, you should be able to, in terms of your aggregate wealth, to withstand a fall in house prices of 10% if your LTI was above 400%, or 25% if your LTI was above 500%. And the final one, which is probably the most effective, that is a requirement that you cannot have certain kinds of mortgages including deferred amortization and variable rate mortgages if you have LTI ratios above 405%. They're quite detailed measures, um, and especially in particular the LTI measure has the virtue that it implicitly targets what's going on in the large cities, because if you have skyrocketing apartment prices, that will be uh, quite it will be quite exposed if you measure uh, value uh, compared to the level of your income. And it seems as if, we are not quite sure yet, but it seems as if it has some interesting uh, and, and warranted effects in the Copenhagen housing market. Now, to prepare for the next downturn, um, I think we are potentially facing quite a serious issue in the next downturn uh, internationally very limited scope for monetary and fiscal expansion. Um, that implies, as I see it, we can simply not allow banks to be part of the problem again. Um, we need to be more careful um, uh, this time. I do believe that if we work with a counter-cyclical capital buffer, we can build it up when it's very easy to raise capital. Um, therefore, we can release it uh, if there's a threatening uh, credit squeeze in the future downturn. That's basically the idea of counter cyclical buffer. And um, my next graph would be that um, we cannot, well, this is just an illustration that our uh, fiscal and monetary policy space is very limited because debt is much higher and the interest rates are much lower, well known. Um, and this is probably the most important slide, and I'll deal a bit with that. How do we argue the case for a higher counter-cyclical buffer for the time being in the absence of, of say, vigorous uh, credit growth? Um, we insist that in normal times, the counter-cyclical buffer should not be zero. It should be positive. Um, we should not wait until we see uh, the final end of a peak up in the financial uh, cycle. And we uh, point to a bunch of various uh, indicators, risk perception, property prices, credit standards, of course, credit developments as such, and other indicators. We supplement it by other information, and that adds up to an advice being given on the buffer rate. You see in the bottom of the table, we have given advice twice now. Um, we are moving quite slowly, um, um, but uh, the buffer has now been decided upon. It happened actually this week with a new advice um, that will be implemented from the third quarter of 2019 because we have, which I think is probably a mistake, this 12 months back before, after a government has taken a decision until it's implemented. That's quite a strong requirement. Then we'll come up to 1% and then we have given forward guidance. The financial sector has actually asked for forward guidance on what's our intention in the future. So if there will be no strong change in the tendency of building up risk in the system, we will uh, go ahead with yet another recommendation in the first quarter of 2019. But as you can see, then we are up until mid-2020, uh, and I just wonder whether this recovery will continue until uh, uh, mid-2020, but maybe the financial part of it will. The right side is the actual uh, indicators we currently use to argue the case for raising the counter cyclical capital buffer. We do have a bunch of indicators uh, implying higher risk taking, uh, stronger competition because banks are actually, they have abundant liquidity, uh, but they cannot really find demand for their lending, so they compete uh, increasingly. There's a very large difference in between banks. We have the property prices increasing. Um, total lending is still at a high level. They do distribute uh, a large share of their earnings, and, and that implies that there's plenty of scope to, to come from here. And I mentioned the issue of monetary and fiscal policy globally. Just to compare, 0.5% as a counter-cyclical buffer requires that the financial institutions will reduce their combined dividends and buyouts from some 95% this year to maybe 87% something. So it's very, very easy for them. It's still uh, obviously um, 
uh, the owners who own this capital, so you don't take anything from anybody, but required to be part of a bank. Now, final graph is, uh, this is actually also happening in other countries. So here we have 10 different countries, by and large in the same situation, not a tremendous amount of credit growth, but other indicators pointing to the fact that you do need a higher counter-cyclical capital buffer now. This is not um, solving all problems in the world, but um, it might make uh, a slight contribution to having a more healthy downturn next time. I'll stop here. Excellent. Thank you, Per. Then uh, the floor to Daniel. So, Daniel, you may want to use, okay. So Daniel Gross from SEPS and uh, is also part of the Advisory Scientific Committee of the SRB. Yes, many thanks for having me and apologies for the late entry. It wasn't planned that way, but I presume you have all made the experience that some days things don't work out as you thought they would. Um, let me try to uh, basically uh, elaborate slightly on the title, which is macro potential policy in recovering economies with the underlying of the recovering. And then I wanted to leave with you a very simple thought about the interaction between uh, macro prudential policies and, uh, and uh, monetary policy. So I think to be clear, uh, in a recovery economy, we mean one where there's still an output gap, uh, but we would just like to give it a little push uh, so that uh, it uh, goes as quickly as possible towards closing uh, the output gap. And I think uh, Peter mentioned already earlier that then you have the fundamental uh, problem that you would like the economy to lever, but not too fast, right, to kill off the recovery. And uh, so the question is, therefore, uh, you have a sort of tug of war between trying to get the uh, leverage down to prepare, if you want, for the next uh, downturn and, uh, and killing the recovery. Now, my simple answer would be what we are seeing is a sort of frozen conflict, as we have many of them in Eastern Europe. Um, basically, and I think this uh, fits well with what we heard about uh, Denmark, uh, we had enormous build-up in leverage, uh, mostly private, but also to some extent public. And then uh, we have now a recovery where we see basically a standstill with lots of ups and downs, and I think Peter mentioned it's very difficult to make a picture because some indicators point to excesses, other indicators don't. Uh, but broadly speaking, I would say there's a sort of a, a standstill. And my question is, is that a standstill or is that lack of progress towards preparation for the next downturn in terms of lower leverage? And uh, my own preference would be to go for rather to that second interpretation rather, uh, rather than saying, everything seems to be fine because this time we have a recovery without credit growth. And I think that's what you said earlier, given the, 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 the upwards trend that we had had over the period up to the, the crisis, we should be more careful than usual uh, right now. Okay, and that, by the way, is the same thing what we observe in fiscal policy, right? We have the, we're entering the downturn, uh, then we ask ourselves how much austerity Right? How to cal calibrate it? We don't want to kill off the recovery, but uh, um, we also don't want them to enter the next recession again with very large deficits. And my view would be that we can view the uh, stability pact and fiscal compact basically a sort of, I shouldn't have said a loan to value ratio, but a debt to income ratio for government. So there they are broadly speaking um, macro potential pool tools. And now we're coming to this recovery with rising asset prices. And uh, I think what we're having right now is with monetary policy one foot on the accelerator and macro potential is slowly getting down on the brake. And I think the case of Denmark, which I regard as an associate member of the Euro, uh, we see that very well. Uh, monetary policy as, uh, let's say, taking over from Frankfurt uh, is very much expansionary but uh, macro potential is trying to, to work against the other way around. And basically, the, the tug of war arises because with lower uh, interest rates from monetary policy, you would like to have agents spend more by taking on more credit. Uh, 
Um, but maybe they already have too much credit, or some of them. So uh, that is why uh, you don't uh, want actually those who have had a lot of credit already to spend more by the others. And I think that is the, uh, that is the problem. There's a nice recent paper which uh, Schularik presented at the AAC, which shows that actually macroprudential policy can in some instances be viewed as equivalent to monetary policy. However, his results apply mainly to emerging markets. Now, why is this important? In my view, this is important right now because we remain in a situation where financing conditions remain really exceptionally favorable. What you see here is the, the, the difference between the growth rate, or rather the interest rate minus the growth rate, and uh, that has been now negative for some time, comma, and is expected to remain that way if you take current forecasts of growth rates and interest rate forward rates uh, for quite some time and exceptionally, of course, within the, within the euro area. And we all know that uh, when you have a situation where the interest rate is much below the growth rate, it's very difficult to become, to distinguish between solvent and insolvent debtors because anybody who can just stick around for long enough will see his income or debt to GDP ratio basically go down to zero. And that's exactly so what you would like to do with macroprudential policy you would like to avoid uh, having too many of these guys around. So, and I think this brings me to one aspect or one tool of uh, loan-to-value ratios, which actually somebody told me are not loan-to-value ratios, but loan-to-appraisal value ratio, uh, because uh, if you have a booming economy and uh, you have banks becoming suddenly much more optimistic about the appraisal value, uh, then they can basically nullify the impact of any formal LTV you have. But let me put that aside. And basically, if my view would be that uh, an LTV works by basically constraining, if you want credit constrained uh, individuals uh, who uh, have to save more in order to buy, for example, a first home, house. And that means that basically only the high net worth individuals can get a credit but they are the ones who don't need it. So uh, my proposition would be that in such a situation, actually an, L an LTV or macro policy more in general, risk making uh, monetary policy less effective. At the limit, if you think of an economy with two agents, creditors and debtors, if you tell the debtors you cannot take on any more any debt, that monetary policy becomes ineffective, ineffective because the creditors have two impact from lower interest rates. They have a, an income effect, which makes them poorer, and substitution effect works, of course, against, but uh, it's largely neutralized. Whereas for the debtor, uh, they cannot take any more credit, and they have the, um, the um, income effect working for them, but they cannot do anything with it. And uh, I think this is uh, the, the, the situation in which we risk uh, coming right now. Um, and of course, for the euro area, what specific is, and that was mentioned earlier by Jay Peter, that we have to some extent national uh, um, macroprudential policies. But to some extent, in the euro area, we have a repeat of what I said at the level of individuals. We have some countries uh, in which, which represent creditor nations not because the nations are creditors, but because they contain many agents who are, who are uh, creditors. And uh, then if you have a situation whereby you have uh, LTVs in the creditor countries, then I, I, there's a risk that monetary policy becomes ineffective because those who could spend uh, are not allowed to, and those who, who, who don't want to, they're not doing it anyway because for them uh, the substitution effect uh, uh, doesn't work. And especially for the euro area, of course, what you then risk is that you have uh, monetary policy trying to push, uh, macro policies are neutering most of it, and in the end uh, you have this stalemate whereby you have uh, to have a monetary policy with rates low for very long, basically because the impact is uh, so small. And therefore, maybe it is useful to think about, uh, in my view at least, uh, 
an earlier exit to macro policy rather than to, to monetary policy, rather than think we go on with monetary policy until we have reached our inflation target, but subsequently put in place macro policies which actually take out most of the steam of monetary policy. Uh, because then uh, probably what we're going to have is we have these excesses due to the I minus G difference in some pockets of the economy where we don't really see them. Uh, they might be smaller, uh, but uh, they will be the ones where actually the, the new expenditure takes place. And I would regard this as, as more dangerous than perhaps making the opposite mistake, which is possible, that you perhaps exit uh, monetary policy too early but at least then you know you don't have to use macro potential policies uh, to stop things which would otherwise arise. So let me stop with this uh, one point that we should be really thinking about this coordination of these two policies and what we do when the two work in opposite directions. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So at this point, uh, uh, if uh, we have the connection going with the fifth panelist, uh, Pierre Richard Agenor from the University of Manchester. Maybe we can have him uh, actually take the floor virtually. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, very well. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, we've heard from uh, previous uh, panelists the uh, the challenges that normalization. Uh, creates for the United States and uh, Europe, especially in a context where uh, uh, fiscal imbalances are, are uh, large in, uh, in some countries. I'm going to focus my remarks on the global implications of monetary policy normalization in major advanced economies. I do have a set of slides uh, that cover these remarks in detail, but I'm not going to use them uh, given the amount of time that I have. But I understand that uh, the slides will be posted on the uh, uh, conference website uh, fairly soon. So what uh, is the environment that we're considering? Well, clearly the post-global uh, financial crisis environment uh, accompanied by low real interest rates and a massive increase in global liquidity has been accompanied by a massive increase in debt. Uh, in uh, all regions, uh, essentially debt by uh, non uh, the non-financial corporate sector. So that's uh, the key uh, fact that I want to highlight uh, to begin with, but there are two other important facts uh, to keep in mind. One is the fact that the globalization of banking has uh, continued uh, uh, at a fairly rapid pace over the past few years, and this has been associated by an increase in bank-related uh, uh, capital flows, but also greater scope for regulatory arbitrage. Uh, the second point is that uh, uh, financial spillovers have become more and more of a two-way street. Uh, uh, we have spillovers from advanced economies to the rest of the world, but uh, increasingly, uh, what we've seen is that there are feedback effects, or what has been called now spillbacks, from a small group of uh, large uh, developing economies uh, toward the uh, major advanced economies. And I want to focus my discussion essentially on uh, uh, that particular group, which I have referred to elsewhere uh, as systemic middle-income countries, uh, SMICs. Uh, I view largely the concept of emerging markets as obsolete, especially when discussing issues of uh, spillovers and uh, spillbacks. So uh, let me briefly address uh, three issues. The first is what are the risks for these uh, SMICs associated with monetary policy and normalization in major advanced economies? Second, what can macroprudential policies do, possibly combined with other policies, especially important for uh, this, that group of countries? What can uh, macroprudential policies do to mitigate these risks? And third, more uh, specifically, what type of uh, uh, instruments uh, should these countries uh, think about, given what we know uh, regarding the performance of these, uh, uh, of these countries. So regarding the first question, uh, as I said uh, uh, earlier, uh, what we've seen again in the immediate aftermath of the uh, GFC is a, uh, in some of these uh, SMICs, is a currency appreciation, uh, excessive foreign currency borrowing, and a buildup of domestic financial imbalances. And in uh, several of these countries, what we've seen is major increase in private sector credit and uh, increases in property, uh, property prices, which has made these countries fairly vulnerable 
to uh, um, uh, monetary policy normalization in MAs. Why? Well, the reason is that when, as we've seen since uh, April, when uh, interest rates start going up in the U.S. and other uh, major advanced uh, economies, uh, the appreciation of the dollar, of the U.S. dollar, leads to a, a fairly uh, large capital uh, outflows, uh, which translate into large depreciations of domestic currencies. This is very clear for countries like Brazil and Turkey, for instance. Now, the depreciation uh, tends to weaken the balance sheets, of course, of highly indebted uh, borrowers, and this tends to increase uh, uh, domestic uh, spreads in banking. But also what has happened since uh, May especially is that some countries have started to increase interest rates in order to mitigate those capital outflows. So the increase in uh, bank, uh, domestic bank borrowing costs uh, coupled with uh, a greater risk uh, uh, premia due to deterioration of balance sheets, the balance sheets of borrowers, both have combined to tighten domestic uh, financial uh, conditions. And this is particularly worrying for these countries because uh, the, the business and the financial cycles in these countries tend to be highly correlated, much more so than in advanced economies. And uh, uh, one reason is the fact that, uh, of course, many of these countries uh, have um, uh, banks uh, finance uh, short-term working capital needs to a greater extent than in uh, advanced, uh, advanced economies. So there is a very strong potential for adverse supply side effects, which uh, combine, even if you have some appreciation associated with high interest rates, you still run the risk of higher inflation. So the policy trade-offs that monetary uh, policy faces uh, have uh, become much uh, stronger in the context of uh, normalization of uh, uh, monetary policy in advanced economies. At the same time, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the potential for spillbacks is greater uh, now. So uh, this creates uh, for major advanced economies uh, incentives, of course, to internalize at least to some extent the potential uh, um, uh, dangers that a, uh, or risks that uh, the situation in, um, in uh, SMICs uh, could, create, uh, could create for them. But the right question, especially when it comes to macroprudential policy, is whether some degree of international coordination could generate a superior outcome as opposed to each country essentially uh, internalizing uh, the effects of these spillovers based on their own uh, national uh, mandate. The second question is what can uh, macroprudentials do? Uh, in a context where indeed you are facing trade-offs in terms of uh, output inflation and domestic financial uh, imbalances and that uh, these trade-offs can actually worsen as a result of uh, large capital outflows induced by uh, high interest rates in uh, advanced economies, uh, the question of course is uh, can macroprudential policies help to mitigate those risks? Well, the evidence uh, on the uh, performance of uh, macroprudential instruments, and that's, that covers a wide range of countries, not only uh, SMICs, uh, is that these instruments tend to be more effective in strengthening the resilience of the financial system, essentially by building uh, buffers, than in preventing the development of financial imbalances uh, themselves. So, uh, but at the same time, what the evidence suggests, especially for SNCs, is that targeted instruments such as uh, DTI and LTV ratios have proved highly effective. And uh, I, uh, my belief is that there is also scope for more aggressive use of some other counter-cyclical tools. And that brings me to my third uh, point, which is what type specifically of instruments uh, could be helpful for these countries. Well, um, my own review of experience with counter-cyclical capital buffers in, uh, in some of these countries is that they are not easy to implement uh, quickly uh, for various reasons. You need to give banks uh, some time to uh, build up the buffers. And uh, in fact, these countries have been using uh, all the tools and they have all the tools at their disposal. Now, one tool that they've been using quite consistently over the years is reserve requirements. Uh, in many cases, uh, reserve requirements were used as a substitute uh, for monetary policy, especially when facing external financial shocks. But uh, uh, more and more, the idea is to uh, uh, 
get uh, uh, the central banks to view it as a counter-cyclical macroprudential uh, uh, tool. And uh, uh, they have proved successful in some, in some cases, Brazil being one of them in the immediate aftermath of the uh, GFC. Uh, another instrument that uh, many countries have put in place in recent years is dynamic uh, uh, provisioning uh, systems, uh, especially after 2008. Uh, in Latin America, right now, five, six countries are, have them in place. Now, again, uh, based on Spain's experience, uh, clearly, the evidence on the performance of these uh, tools is rather mixed, and uh, they haven't been really tested in these countries as of yet, although they may well be uh, pretty soon. But the, the sentiment is that uh, even though they may not be uh, able uh, to uh, prevent or, uh, the, uh, the buildup of financial imbalances, especially credit, uh, credit growth, uh, rapid credit growth, they can, in combination with other tools, be used to uh, 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 stabilize uh, the uh, real financial uh, uh, cycles. The challenge, of course, is to uh, calibrate uh, these, in these instruments. So to conclude uh, briefly, uh, what I can say is that uh, the path to normalization is a narrow one for, uh, for many of the major advanced economies. And spillovers from this normalization process, assuming that it remains uh, orderly, are a major challenge for central banks in, uh, in uh, middle-income countries, especially the systemic ones, uh, because some of them are already facing large uh, financial imbalances. And that means that there's limited room for maneuver with monetary policy. And uh, macroprudential policies is important to address these uh, trade-offs. But in addition to that, there are other tools at their disposal. Uh, if indeed uh, exchange rate stability is a, a, a key concern, and the experience proves that it is for these countries, then sterilized foreign exchange intervention, which has been used massively in many of them in the past few years, remains an option. Uh, capital controls should not be excluded either. So uh, that, I think, is an important point. The, the policy mix uh, may need to be broader than simply uh, monetary policy combined with macroprudential regulation. Of course, the line between macroprudential regulation and uh, capital controls is blurred at times, depending on the intent, as you know, but uh, the policy mix may and should be broader than uh, these uh, two policies. And there's also a need, if, especially if the uh, normalization process becomes somehow disorderly, there may be a need for more flexibility in pursuing inflation, inflation targets. Last uh, point here is simply that uh, indeed, uh, there is uh, the possibility, it is possible that uh, greater coordination across countries of macroprudential policies uh, may be beneficial. Uh, as you know, Basel III includes the principle of reciprocity, which already provides some starting point for coordination of uh, uh, capital buffers. But uh, the, uh, the broader issue is uh, to what extent, uh, given the importance of bank related capital flows, to what extent is coordination useful to mitigate the cross-border effects of uh, uh, regulatory arbitrage? Uh, can we uh, find, indeed, a superior outcome for the world economy at large? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so here, uh, I'm, let me try to get uh, now the discussion going on uh, within the panel. Uh, as. Uh, as uh, we heard, uh, there are uh, very, very different uh, positions. So let me go back to the questions that essentially I think uh, this panel is about. And the question is whether we should activate macro-proof today, uh, uh, macro-prudential tools today, uh, uh, based both on the recollection of uh, uh, past experiences, uh, Governor Lane was uh, um, uh, saying yesterday, and uh, Per Callison, in a way, has uh, also said uh, uh, today that you know we, we cannot afford uh, essentially uh, banks uh, to uh, fail us again uh, and, and uh, to cause a new uh, a new crisis uh, as in the past. So so this is uh, one uh, viewpoint essentially, which is uh, buttressed by the evidence that Esther. Uh, has presented at the beginning. We had, uh, we had uh, uh, monetary policy uh, very lax for very long. Uh, this is likely to have increased uh, uh, risk-taking at the aggregate level. 
And uh, that's one argument for actually starting seriously to think about activating macro proof tools. The second argument uh, is the one that um, uh, Governor Carlson has uh, given us that we should, uh, in a way, prepare. Now that uh, the sun is shining, we should uh, start preparing for the rainy days uh, when uh, uh, essentially we, uh, um, uh, monetary policy will become restrictive and asset prices uh, may. Uh, 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 may actually drop with a, a snapback and, and cause uh, potential instability. So these are the arguments for acting now. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we heard uh, more words for greater caution, if I understood correctly, from Peter Pratt. Uh, and uh, also we heard uh, a kind of uh, somewhat different position from Daniele. He says that in a way here we are in a kind of standstill with the monetary policy being expansionary. So even if we activate actually macro proof policy, actually this is not going to do any good because in a way it's just going to muffle the effect or moderate uh, the effects of uh, uh, monetary policy. So we'd rather, he'd rather go for much faster uh, uh, monetary policy normalization. So these are very uh, different uh, uh, positions. and. Uh, again, I, will, uh, I want to remind you of uh, what we heard this morning from, uh, uh, from Franks, from uh, the IMF, uh, who actually uh, uh, also was very cautious. And he mentioned one point which has emerged, uh, in a way, in the last uh, intervention by Agenor. And it is that you know, uh, monetary policy is kind of global. It fills all the cracks, so to speak, whereas uh, macroprudential policy can be targeted at specific uh, 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 bubbles, uh, specific instability, specific countries, and so on. And this is uh, also something that uh, uh, Peter uh, Pratt uh, reminded us uh, of. And that's another reason, maybe, for activating macro tools selectively in some countries, in some sectors right now. So I would like to now pose uh, this kind of issue again to the panel and uh, uh, you know, uh, try to make some progress and see if uh, we can make uh, some progress towards a consensus or rather not. Uh, so uh, maybe we can start uh, uh, with Peter again, if you want. Um, when you when you say macro pro, uh, I always have in mind time dimension and cross section dimension. So uh, uh, it seems that you have more the time dimension in that discussion. Mm -hmm. I look at the cross section dimension with still, I mean, urgent things to do. So. Uh, what, what are the main sort of scenarios we could envisage listening to? I mean, uh, there are not many. I mean, uh, basically you get, you know, the big asset price, you know, uh, correction, you know, a repricing of risk globally. Uh, and, uh, and then you have to think, you know, about the scenario, how would it would transmit. We heard uh, just in the previous intervention about the, the, uh, the SMIX, you know, and, and that sort of transmission. But I'm also from our point of view, <clears throat> from a central bank, what worries me in that scenario, the halt to, this, the, to redemption that you may have, you know, of course, because many funds on the asset side are illiquid. They have some liquidity lines with banks, so I don't know who provides the liquidity. And that's my, the opacity I was mentioned before, and that worries me. And of course, who is the candidate there when you have a run on liquidity on, a, on an illiquid uh, institution? Of course, the central bank. So when you say, should we activate uh, macroprudential instruments? Well, I say you should, you should rush. <laughs> you know, about looking about the uh, liquidity risk in uh, asset management companies, uh, because if we think, you know, that scenario, that the repricing of risk is a possibility, uh, then I would like to have a scenario and see, you know, and testing that sort of scenario, not only seeing what banks, you know, happen, you know, when there is a big recession, but I want to, to, to see a little bit more. I'm, I'm not very qualified to speak about that. As I say before, uh, I, I use only public information on this. So, I, so uh, maybe you will reassure me. But from my point of view as a central bank, I see very well, you know, uh, we have the possibility to create liquidity. And then immediately, if the problem is worldwide, you get, of course, this question about, you know, market maker of last resort, of course. And that's one of the things I have uh, in mind in that sort of discussion. So I think that the work, you know, uh, when you talk about macroprudential policy, I think that we should really rush up in, in that direction. The other thing which we heard is uh, the, the push and the pull. Uh, well, the, 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 it's the accelerator, yes, still, uh, that uh, Daniel, but as you also said, Marco, the pull is more uh, targeted. Uh, 
And that's a little bit, so we agree, or we disagree about this. Huh? But one is this, you still need a substantial degree of stimulus to bring the economy, you know, where you want it to go. Uh, but of course, you see pockets and you see perhaps, uh, for example, in the most recent figures about confidence indicators where the industry plateaus and, and confidence goes somewhat down, it's still a very high, high level. But when you look at construction in general, it, it really goes up very strongly. So then you go, of course, in things you don't like to do too much, which is a bit micromanagement, the allocation of credit, of course. But still, I mean, in an environment where you think that that policy has to continue, I think it's useful what we heard from Pierre, you know, and uh, the targeting on, on the real estate, I think, is something that makes sense, I think. I wanted to also, uh, in the, the uh, Danish experience, very interesting to see the experience because how you take these decisions and implement that decision because politically these are extremely sensitive things and we see that many several countries want to implement these and at very much difficulties and then as i said before they use the the other sort of instruments macro prudential like you know buffers in banks you know tightening you know uh, capital requirements for real estate loans and things like this, but it's not necessarily the best way to do it. I mean, I think that's a very interesting discussion to look at the politics, the politics you know, uh, of, uh, of macroprudential instruments more than what we do in general. And I found it very interesting because you, you didn't mention it, it. It looked very smooth, you know, the way you presented it. So I'm, I'm very curious. And, and the very last point is on the what we call normal. And that leads me to because you deal with not only banks, with asset management, but with pension funds and insurance. Now, another scenario which I have in mind is the, because we had uh, yesterday in the General Council a very fascinating discussion on aging and the impact on public finances, of course. But there is another discussion about low rates for a long time, which may be, you know, the <laughs> right or wrong, but which may mean that central banks are only one part of the issue of low rates. Maybe also the other part, which has related to demographic, believe it or not, but I mean, that's a discussion. And then if that would be the case, of course, you may also think about scenarios where uh, lo long rates remain low for a very long time for different reasons than just monetary policy. So your normalization, and that's a little bit the, the discussion in the US today, the normalization uh, of monetary policy does not necessarily lead to nominal long-term rates, which are quite higher than what you see, you know, for example, in the US, as you know. Uh, in markets, usually they will peak, you know, not much more than what you see today. Again, it's an assumption, but in, when, you, when you draw scenarios and you try to see the resilience, you cannot exclude also that, you know, the peak of nominal rates will not be some, what some uh, institutions think will be, given, of course, the promises they did in terms of pensions, of course. Huh? Uh, and so going back to normal is something also which I would like to, to see a little bit tested much more. Per, you wanted to say something on this? Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe that. Okay, uh, th three points. Uh, the first was this smooth. Um, no, um, mm -hmm. there was uh, mm -hmm. quite a lot of discussion around mm -hmm. every single measure uh, pushed back from the industry. Uh, they did lobbying in Parliament, uh, who could potentially prevent this. Mm -hmm. um, Fortunately, we have a tradition. If you sit around a table and work reasonable with stuff for, for a while, then then uh, it, it can it can uh, be solved out. Um, some of us might have wished to go a little bit faster than uh, what's happening. I sort of indicated that, but I think it's by and large all right. Second point, um, I think, uh, Danny, you have a point um, on um, some of these macro potential measures, obviously taking some heat out of the monetary policy stimulus, which is happening. You pointed to a specific factor with the LTVs. Um, I'm not convinced this is a dominating factor, but I think that's one of several. Obviously, if you take out uh, the, um, uh, the stimulus or at least part of the stimulus through lower interest rates uh, to uh, the housing market, to commercial real estate market, you, you take out part of, of, of the monetary stimulus. Um, um, I don't think that's a reason for changing the composition because it's only taking out part of it. That is only taking out part of it in some countries and not all countries, so it's still rational to do what's happening here. But, but we have to acknowledge that. On the counter cycle capital buffer, though, I would surely agree with those having said that this is not something which is going to contain our excesses. Uh, this is taking place in an environment with very high profits, at least in my country, so it's very easy for them to capitalize uh, appropriately. Mm. Uh, but um, it will work 
as one instrument which can uh, potentially help us in the downturn. Third point is, um, um, as a more generally, are we by doing what we are doing overly risk avert, so to speak? Um, we had this uh, very interesting uh, presentation on Commerzbank and, and what happened there. And, and one interpretation of what happened uh, after the financial crisis is a, a major uh, beef up of tail risk aversion, which uh, in the first round affects the financial sector and demand. Um, but uh, given that we have seen employment uh, actually coming back big time in uh, Quite a, uh, most advanced countries, uh, uh, at least, uh, there's no any, not any longer any employment or unemployment problem in, in, in most countries uh, remaining there. Uh, some countries where this is left over. We are stuck with a, a, per, a more apparently permanent productivity change environment. But if you look to it broader, I think this tail risk aversion could be something also affecting not only business investment, but think about cyber security, think about physical security. If we are all becoming quite upset about security and tail risk events, um, that will have an impact on, on, the, on the economy, uh, which can last pretty long. Uh, I don't think there's any alternative. And given that we burned all our macroeconomic ammunition last time, uh, we cannot allow ourselves not to be risk averse, but it, it does have an, uh, an impact. Yes. Maybe Daniel, you want to add something to? Yeah, just to reiterate, the case of Denmark, I think, is very interesting because basically you have to take monetary policy as given, and then you try to squash down the excesses which arise. And I think we agree uh, that then that takes some of the heat off the economy, right? We can discuss whether it's a small part or a big part. Mm. But your situation, in a certain sense, is analogous to any single member country of the euro area. So any single member country which has a national macroprudential policy will take the overall policy as given, mm -hmm. right? And then maximizes, so to speak, from a national point of view, the use of macroprudential policies like in Denmark, to squash down. But if everybody does it, then basically, and nobody takes into account the fact that by doing so, that country also diminishes the effectiveness of the common monetary policy. In the end, therefore, you have an equilibrium where one after another in the countries where you have excesses, they squash down and thereby neuter a large part of the common monetary policy, which then has to stay lower for longer. There's an externality there, which is not taken into account. And that is why this setup, which appears natural at first sight, common monetary policy, national macroprudential policies, in the end will not perhaps deliver the optimal outcome. Esther, would you want to comment I, on yeah, I, I, a macro, I, I think macro Daniel's point is very charming. And I think that, uh, yeah, we, there should be a way to measure this, this uh, uncoordination externality. I think it's very relevant. Um, no, I have uh, only um, two small points, which is like, um, you know, I'm not, so I'm not so reassured by to your first slides, the uh, Kalesan slides was like, we have recovery and we have mod and, and, and I counted there was the word moderation three times. But we have already had that. I mean, just before the crisis, there was a lot of moderation and a lot of claim of success of monetary policy. And, you know, we were all happy. So I'm not so, you know, reassured by the idea that there is again the great moderation because last time it wasn't, it wasn't very good. Um, that's the first thing. And then the second thing, on the cross-sectional dimensions, um, I, I, I think the reason for which it's good to put emphasis on the time dimension, as Marco was doing, is because they are probably we have more information. On the cross-sectional dimension, if I understood correctly uh, Daniel's slides, there is this issue that we don't have information about shadow banking or other sectors that we might want to smash. And so the cross-sectional dimension of macroprudential policy might be less effective. So, you know, you, you, you you pump liquidity and maybe this liquidity 
sacked, particularly by sectors like shadow banking, where the appetite for risk is huge and there's no possibility to smash them down. And so that's, that's another type of externality which is not taken into account, that in the cross-sectional thing, there is an informational friction. That's it. Thank you. I would like to involve uh, Pierre Richard in particular on one point, uh, uh, Pierre Richard, that uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I yeah, can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if I understood correctly, towards the end of your uh, intervention, you were saying that uh, uh, we're raising an issue of timing, that in many, um, uh, say, middle income uh, systemic countries, as you call them, uh, it may be, uh, in a way, a bit too late to go for uh, macroprudential uh, 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 policies of the type that we were uh, talking about, like Per was mentioning about raising counter-cyclical buffers and stuff like that, that in a way, uh, in situations such as uh, uh, Turkey, Brazil, and so on, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the policy, uh, you know, the policy problems are already, uh, have already a different sign, uh, because these countries are already uh, uh, facing uh, the instability uh, from the normalization of monetary policy in advanced countries. Did I understand you right? Or uh, Yes, to some extent. Uh, indeed, if you look at uh, Brazil and Turkey in particular, uh, there is an issue of uh, raising uh, counter-cyclical capital buffers uh, in Brazil, for instance, right now would not be uh, the best, uh, the best uh, response. The problem is, uh, my point was actually a bit more general, uh, which is essentially that uh, uh, there are timing issues in the sense that when, whenever you decide to increase those buffers, you have to give banks uh, some time uh, to, uh, to do that. And uh, uh, in fact, these countries have used other instruments that are directly under the control of the central bank. I'm talking about the reserve requirements which have proved highly effective and uh, fairly easy uh, to implement. Now, r keep in mind that I'm talking about countries where reserve requirements are uh, a lot higher than what you observe in the euro area, for instance, the 2% or 3%, unless I'm mistaken, that you observe in the euro area. In those countries, you're talking about much higher. So the potential for manipulating those instruments, uh, reducing them drastically if needed, as Brazil did, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the uh, global financial crisis is much uh, uh, stronger. Now, if I may, uh, I just wanted to add two more points uh, to what I said earlier. And I think the first point is really that when looking at uh, advanced economies and, and uh, SMICs for that matter, I think uh, it's extremely important to understand that the trade-offs that you're facing are not only macroeconomic stability and financial stability. There is the, uh, uh, an essential issue is that of exchange rate stability. It's always been a concern for these countries, even those who adopted inflation targeting early on, where supposedly the exchange rate would be left uh, to float a bit more, uh, or freely actually. Uh, this has never been really the case uh, uh, in practice. And this idea that there is these countries face a fear of floating is quite old, and it's related to competitiveness considerations the fear that appreciation would really drive uh, uh, the economy into, uh, into, recessions, into a recession. But I think what I want to stress is that in the current environment, after this massive increase in global debt and, uh, uh, that uh, these countries have faced, the key issue is actually uh, the impact of the exchange rate on balance sheets and uh, the possible adverse effect that it could have on uh, the banking system in some of these countries, despite massive reforms. Brazil has been, for instance, leading in many areas uh, in terms of adoption of Basel III. So these countries, so if you apply a, uh, in a naive way uh, the Timbergen rule, well, if you have a third objective, then you need a third instrument. And what countries have been using to a very large extent is foreign exchange uh, intervention. Mm. Uh, some have used also capital controls with a broader issue. But the point that I would like to make is that in the environment that we're facing, in fact, uh, foreign exchange intervention may be motivated more by financial stability considerations uh, than, than, uh, in the, than by competitiveness or uh, uh, other uh, considerations. So the rationale uh, for, so it's really this view that foreign exchange intervention in some ways is also a macroprudential instrument in the current environment. 
So the second point I wanted to uh, make briefly is regarding uh, coordination. Uh, we know that coordination of monetary policy works does not really work well internationally, except, except in specific uh, in crisis situations. That's what history uh, uh, teaches us. Um, and in the current process, uh, clearly, uh, major advanced economies remain focused on their national uh, objectives. At the same time, I think that uh, the precedent that uh, uh, the principle of reciprocity in Basel III has created is indeed the idea that there is now an explicit framework for, uh, that uh, uh, induces countries to cooperate. Now the question is, uh, remains how much uh, uh, each country can gain uh, from this coordination and whether it's beneficial for the world as a whole. Uh, it's an issue that I've been spending quite a bit of time uh, working on with uh, colleagues at the, uh, the BIS and uh, the evidence is, appears to be mixed. Uh, there is some gain for the world economy, which is not large, but uh, very often uh, some uh, countries uh, are going to lose, for, even though it's beneficial world, uh, for the world as a whole. So the question is, how do we implement those, uh, those agreements, those cooperative agreements in, uh, in practice? Well, Richard, I guess that the, the outlook is not great for co coordination <laughs> right now in the world more generally. That's for sure. So I would like to use the last eight uh, remaining eight minutes uh, for uh, questions from the floor. Uh, so if uh, there are any questions or uh, remarks, yeah, there. Hello, Alessandra Iovine. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first one is about emerging markets. So um, what we were saying, I just want to confirm if I get it correctly. Um, so in case of a US continuing rising interest rate, should emerging market then act counter cyclically? So lowering interest rate to, in this way, support their economic growth? First question. Second question um, was about the assessment of the consumption um, ratio. Um, the lower consumption ratio um, in despite the high wealth ratio. So in, we, we understood, we conclude from that, um, that um, the savings were higher uh, despite, um, were higher uh, in contrast of um, the private consumption um, um, increasing. So um, could we expect that the financial market conditions are strong enough to um, um, re react in case of a downward uh, turn of economic cycle after our uh, expansionary monetary policy? So I guess this second question goes to Per. Uh, yeah, I guess it was my diagram on sure. consumption sure. ratio you were pointing to. Um, at least one reflection is, if it's true that part of the explanation is that, that uh, consumers are not factored in in full the gains they have seen for lower interest rates on their debt, then maybe they wouldn't react uh, in, 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 uh, tremendously if interest rates are, uh, are coming up again. So that might uh, act as a stabilizer. Uh, frankly, this is the most surprising part of, of the economic development, which is also an answer to to your point about uh, moderation. Uh, I, I mean, my point on moderation was not a prediction. It was an explanation on what had happened in the past. And first, this is surprising uh, that it has been uh, as moderate uh, as it is. And, and I mean, uh, second, uh, we need to, um, uh, we need to uh, uh, go uh, look ahead to the risks we, we, we are having there. There's a clear risk that if this risk aversion disappears, there's a, a potential upturn uh, in the economy. Uh, maybe this is too strong. Daniel wants to add. Wanted to add. This is exactly what I was trying to describe. When you have this monetary policy expansionary, wealth goes up, right? Interest rates go down. And then you basically don't allow the poor to take out credit and consume, and you observe a increasing um, savings rate, and the only recovery you can have is basically on the external side. And therefore, I think this is exactly the picture you might get when you have a expansion of monetary policy and restrictive macroprudential. 
uh, maybe Pierre Richard, you want to answer the first question that was about uh, what should be the yes. monetary policy reaction in uh, emerging well, markets. The, yes, this is at the heart of the problem that central banks are facing, uh, uh, are faced with, where you have several objectives and one instrument does not affect the objectives in the same way. The, if you increase uh, uh, interest rates, as I said earlier, in order to, to uh, mitigate capital, uh, capital outflows, this actually uh, raises borrowing costs for, uh, for banks and eventually for, uh, for customers. And that will uh, also, if you have a, uh, a cost channel, which is, tends to be quite strong in these countries because uh, they borrow a lot short term to finance uh, working capital needs, then you may have actually a contractionary effect uh, on uh, uh, on output. So, what is the alternative? Is uh, what, as, as suggested by uh, um, in the question, is whether or not can they lower interest rates? Well, not really, because actually, if you lower interest rates in a context where interest rates are increasing in advanced economies, you're going to have more capital outflows, which is going to lead to more depreciation and therefore a further weakening of the balance sheet. And another uh, thing to consider in that case is also the possibility that uh, the path through of exchange rate depreciation is very strong. What we know from the evidence in the case of Turkey, for instance, less clear for Brazil and some others, but in Turkey, the path through is very, very quick, which means that uh, lowering interest rates in order to try to mitigate adverse effects on activity is actually uh, you're going to uh, uh, end up uh, giving you more depreciation, a further weakening of the balance sheets of heavily indebted borrowers and uh, uh, eventually and possibly uh, a high inflation fairly quickly because of how uh, rapid the pass through is. So there is no uh, monetary policy by itself cannot address uh, all, all of these issues. So hence the need to combine, uh, uh, macro, to combine that with macro prudential instrument, or as I said earlier, to go further and actually have also a third instrument, which would be for foreign exchange intervention. Okay. Richard? Richard Portis yep. here? Yep. Do members of the panel see anything more than anecdotal evidence that the uh, long, low for long interest rate environment has led to the accumulation of systemic risk imbalances that, uh, uh, that involve systemic risk? whether in advanced or emerging market countries. Anyone? The search, for, the search for yield. Oh, no. Daniel says no. <laughs> no evidence. No. Well, uh, no, I mean, the, the, what is always in my mind, the, the, what is the counterfactual? I mean, you see, it's again the same. Had you done that, what would you have, you see? So at some point, of course, low for long, you get the other question, of course. And that's why we are here to discuss. So the assessment is to say, well, to some extent, we don't, we don't know. Um, I mentioned, you know, this uh, probably, um, referring to the, the previous intervention, a lot of illiquid, you know, bonds, currency issue uh, in asset management companies with some redemption risk, which, you know, amounts are sizable, eh, as we know. So I would say probably, I, I don't know, that's not my business now. Uh, but uh, I would, I, if I would have to, to look, uh, I would look into that, of course, as, as a first candidate. And, uh, and then I would say, I think what had to be done uh, was right in policy, in monetary policy. Uh, I think at some point when the economy recovers, these questions come. I must confess that I was amazed to see the figures about uh, currency exposures, dollar exposures of uh, bonds, huh? basically uh, from, uh, uh, sorry, SMICs, but uh, broader than the SMICs. I mean, uh, beyond that also, uh, that's true. I mean, I was, uh, and therefore my point, the point I'm making, I think it's uh, not only looking at the, the cycle, but looking a little bit at the structural aspect in terms of, uh, you know, regulation in uh, some of these. But I don't know, as I said before, because I'm not in, in that business. Yeah. So, um, Talk, talking about, uh, you know, potential uh, exposures, you mentioned exposures, I would like to remind uh, everyone of the persistent problem uh, 
of uh, sovereign exposures uh, of banks, in particular of Italian banks, which have kind of uh, resumed, has, have already increased uh, considerably in, in May, June, uh, and, uh, and therefore the fact that uh, you know, we keep having this kind of potential bomb in, the, uh, in terms of macroprudential risk within uh, the financial system, the euro area financial system, which uh, you know, uh, in, uh, if interest rates uh, rise, uh, rise considerably, could uh, actually be detonated and uh, uh, start uh, at least uh, within some countries uh, a process of uh, huge instability. That, uh, and we have already gone through that particular movie, so we know that that is uh, a big danger. So, Per? No, I mean, the question on systemic risk, um, whether it's systemic or not, uh, I'm not sure we will see that uh, exactly, but we will know uh, by one time. But uh, there are certainly risk out there. I mean, the valuation of, of uh, housing and, and stock prices uh, in, in many uh, uh, quarters of the world is certainly an observation point. Um, I'm not sure it's only foreign or sovereign uh, risk we're talking about here, but to the extent that uh, the very low interest rate environment has been embedded in, in expectations and, and people are not sufficiently prepared for uh, a reversal of that. That's certainly also uh, a systemic risk. But in, 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 in very general terms, um, I think this has turned out somewhat better than one could have feared. Um, if you had asked me uh, 10, 15 years ago um, if uh, what I would have thought about an economy on the background of a very strong employment uh, increase uh, seven years ahead where interest rates, uh, you can actually have uh, mortgages with negative interest rates, uh, what that economy would look like. I'm not sure I would have predicted it was as uh, uh, sort of civilized as, 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 as is happen happening now. So something has definitely happened. It, it may be also a reflection why monetary policy has been an extreme. It's reacting to something which has been quite extreme on, on the other side. Daniel, you, want to, you wanted to add anything? No. Okay, so I think we have to call it to a close. Uh, I'm sorry we are eight minutes late, but uh, I hope that uh, your ideas uh, are somewhat clearer <laughs> regarding the, the needed stance for macroprudential policy in, the, in Europe in particular now. Thank you to all of you. Thank you.